We now turn back to the rec to the report of the history of this movement, and we've come down to about 1916. The Brinsmead brothers have come to America for the first time. They've had their confrontation with the General Conference, and down in Australia, down in Australia and New Zealand, things are moving on toward uh, a climax there as well. Now, <clears throat> I'll come back to New Zealand and. Um, carry the story on as it happened down there for a little bit. With the introduction of the new theologies, the teaching that Christ came in sinless flesh for instance, the uh, downgrading of the sanctuary message, the um, rejection of the truth that we can live a sinless life, the Seventh-day Adventist ministers or the evangelists in New Zealand now found themselves able to bring in a different kind of public presentation. They now began to copy the Billy Graham type of evangelism and the result was that they were able to fill their halls with hundreds upon hundreds of people. The, um, and the baptisms they recorded now were, were multiplied far beyond what they had multiplied before, but the standard was a way down. For instance, in the Danaverk Church, I attended a baptism one Sabbath morning. There was only three people involved. And um, that afternoon, the man who was, who was baptized spent the afternoon building his daughter's home and smoking cigarettes while he did so. The minister seemed to think that all, all one had to do in order to be baptized was to declare loyalty to the Adventist system, observe the Seventh-day Sabbath more or less, and the rest was up to you. Now, in consequence of this, a large number of new converts joined the Adventist Church and their children then became candidates for education at Longburn College where I was teaching. And so we had a unique situation in the beginning of 1960 when we had the largest influx of students ever, a mixture of, of, of young people straight from uh, newly converted uh, homes and of course the long established Adventist families around the North New Zealand Conference. Now, as these young people walked into the school that year, it, it became very apparent to the principal and to each of us teachers that we were going to have a lot of trouble during this coming year. And so the principal or president of the college addressed us in our first faculty meeting and said to, to all the teachers, there's no question about the fact we have a very, very serious uh, problem facing us this year. The young people coming in from these newly converted Adventist homes are not converted, they're still very worldly, and therefore the responsibility rests upon us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring about their conversion. Well, uh, I knew what this meant of course, the principal himself who is very devoted to Billy Graham and modern evangelical uh, preaching, the so-called evangelical gospel, I knew he'd stand up and preach the Billy Graham type service to the young people as, as would most of the other teachers along with him and I would stand quite alone in preaching a different kind of gospel altogether. And so sure enough it proved to be that um, the Friday evening uh, service, we always had a Friday, Friday evening service for the young people called the Vesper service, uh, which was taken by one or the other of the teachers and by the president of the college himself and the president, or principal as I shall call him, that, that being the name down there, the principal, would stand up and read a text such as 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, I determined to know nothing amongst you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And uh, he'd make some remarks upon that text, followed by a series of very emotional, stirring stories, extremely emotional, stirring stories, designed to, uh, to, to uh, move the, the students emotionally. And after about 45 minutes of this kind of preaching, he would then give an altar call, <coughs> just as Billy Graham does, and would plead with the young folk to come down and give their hearts to Jesus and, and begin a new life. Well, sure enough, of course, they came down. Half the room would come down, crowd around the altar or the desk. And I watched carefully and I noticed that um, the ones who were, who were first to come down were always the ones next to be in trouble with the faculty. And that year... Uh, we had more trouble in the school than any other year I was there and I would say <clears throat> I would say about 25% of the students were disfellish, um, not, not expelled from the school and sent home again and another 10% ought to have been. I won't list the problems we had because they're rather 
shocking to say the least during that particular year <clears throat> well at the same time I, I didn't uh, dare to preach too publicly in the school the stronger points of the message I I gave rather softened versions of the truth because I, I just didn't dare do it from the open public pulpit <coughs> excuse me but um, there was no prohibition against faculty members and teachers having meetings in their own homes and so I opened my doors to students who came across of their own free will to sit and listen to the presentations of Bonnie's to Freedom, the Sanctuary Message and so on. And we had some very blessed fellowships together. Mostly the students who came to my home were from established Adventist homes and combined with the effect of the message upon their hearts they gave no trouble to the faculty whatsoever not one of those students ever were called up before, before faculty during the year let alone be expelled but some of them came from the new converts as well there were two boys their names were George Caspel and Michael Himes who had been who came from two families in, in Wellington who had recently joined the Adventist church and these two young men seemed to find nothing more delightful than to cause trouble in the school they go to town and come back with a bag full of meat pies <laughs> to spice their dull college fare they put coins in the light sockets and when the when you switch the lights on of course they blow the fuses for half the, half the building they would pour his buckets of water over the door so when the preceptor or dean of men came in to get a bath <laughs> They'd read comics during their class sessions and uh, the preceptor, which you call the dean, of, dean of men over here, we call him the preceptor or law keeper, said to me one day in sheer exasperation, he said, Freddie said, um, that George and Michael are the, are the worst two boys in the entire dormitory. He said, I warned them, he said, let them, let them get to one more escapade and home they go. I've had them. Finish. Well, the escapade uh, they, they planned next was to go over to my place and disrupt one of my meetings and uh, it was Sabbath afternoon between lunch and young people's meeting and uh, the study group was assembling about 10 or 15 students all together in my living room and they came and knocked at the door and I opened it and here was George and Michael and they, I said what, what would you like and they said we're going to come to the meeting I said okay come on in and I assigned them two vacant chairs in the back left hand corner of the room and they sat there and they told me later they just sat down for the moment to size the situation and wait the opportune moment to cause trouble well, I began to give the study in a solemn import so captivated their minds they gave no trouble at all during the entire class session which lasted about an hour they went away to come again and a few days or a week or so later the preceptor said to me Freddie so I just can't figure some things out he said that George and Michael have made a great change I don't know why but they have and George and Michael never had mentioned before the faculty again for the rest of the year and they were never expelled from the college either and they became for a time two very strong enthusiastic believers in the message until finding the pressure of the church when they found out caused them to drop it maybe yet they might uh, the seed sown might bear fruit someday but I'm rather doubtful and so in the school that year I had a remarkable opportunity to witness the effect of evangelical Protestant preaching versus the preaching of this message and what capped the whole thing off was the fact that down toward the end of the year Pastor Kranz, the college president was one day in his office and he was a man who was deeply disappointed because it seemed, in fact the fact was the harder he preached his, his evangelical type of message the worse the school situation became and it seems so terribly important to him to end the school year with a united converted body of students and a young woman named Carol Tagg who was his assistant in the library and was in the office getting instructions from him uh, was there and he talked to her and yet more or less to himself and he said uh, aloud in her hearing he said there's some things I can't understand he said this um, teaching that Fred Wright is, is uh, promoting around the school is the worst teaching that history has ever produced that's how he wrote it the worst it's ever produced yet he said how is it that every student who accepts that message becomes a model student he said I just can't figure it at all that's what he said 
Now you think that when that kind of evidence is before a person's mind, they sit down and do some plain sober thinking, wouldn't you, and say, well, there's got to be something in that message, I better, I better make a more close investigation of it. But when the mind is gripped by evangelical Protestantism or Babylonianism, which offers uh, such an easy pathway to heaven, when you spend years and years reading books by these Babylonian writers, when you fill the college library with them at great expense to the cause, then your mind is preoccupied with a prejudice so strong that you can't see the light, even though you're forced to admit that the effect of the real message is so strong and powerful. Now, during 1960, I had an extremely busy, one of the busiest in my entire lifetime. During that year, I was a teacher, I think, of eight class sessions per day. I, I, I taught woodwork, building instruction, engineering, art and general science. I was the architect and general supervisor of a, of a, of a very extensive uh, rebuilding program in which they're building a complete new classroom block, a new dining room, a new office area and so forth. On top of that I had to supervise the maintenance program. On top of that I was conducting usually at least two ch church services a week, um, one during the week in the, ch in the chapel service or vesper service and one uh, service out on the Sabbath as well. I was giving Bible studies on Friday evening, Sabbath morning before Sabbath school, Sabbath afternoon after Sabbath school, uh, after church service, and then I'd, then I'd drive 50 miles to give another set of Bible studies. I had more on Sunday and Monday, and I was going to university and doing two university subjects as well, so I was rather busy. <laughs> and um, I, I faced a crisis early in the year. I was, I was aiming to get myself a degree at the university in, in uh, history, so I could... Um, advance in my work for the college and for the for the Adventist movement but I found that um, as the year progressed I should mention this point first of all this is when I first began to practice the Sabbath rest principles and I shouldn't overlook this important point when that year began 1960 I saw with tremendous clarity that if I continued to preach this message I would really cause great disruption in the college and I went to God and asked for his wisdom in the matter because I saw myself that whichever way I went I had um, a condemnation from the Bible to condemn my course of action. In the first case I saw that when King Saul oppressed Israel and David had the opportunity to war against the king he refused to do so but left the change of situation entirely and completely in God's hands and I said to myself well there's no question about the fact that Pastor Cranz is the president of this school that's his position it's not mine and therefore he not I has the right to determine what should be taught in the school that's his job and while I'm being paid by this school I have to respect that uh, that position and so I saw from that principle I should say nothing just let the matter rest in God's care but at the same time, my mind was directed to the statement of great controversy where Sister Wise says that God gives a special truth in time of emergency. Who dare refuse to publish it? His servants have nothing to do with consequence and must perform their duty and leave the results with God. The reference is page 609 and 10, if I remember correctly, in the great controversy. <clears throat> yes, um, it says... Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with this light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives a special truth. Um, lost a, uh, you're right. I'll start again. You're right. The Lord gives a special truth to the people in an emergency. Who dare refuse to publish it? He commands his servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. Christ's ambassadors have no, nothing to do with consequence. They must perform their duty and leave results with God. 609 and 610 in the book Great Controversy. And so I had one directive which said be quiet and the other which said speak up. And I said, well, I don't have the wisdom to work this out but Christ is my wisdom as well as my sanctification. So I said, Lord, it's your problem. And as I prayed, my mind went to the woodwork shop where all the tools hang upon the wall, saws, hammers, chisels, screwdrivers, drills and so forth. And uh, I saw myself as one of those tools and God as being the workman. Now those tools hung there patiently as long as you left them there 
and when you went down and picked one off the wall and used it, it was used, and when you were finished, you put it back, and it waited till the next usage came along. And I said, Lord, from now on, I'm going to be just a simple screwdriver in your hands, or, or a spanner, or a wrench, or whatever. And I said, Lord, I will not say a single word, I'll not make any attempt to dig up souls and to convert them to this message, unless I said, you arrange the whole thing. I will speak only at your command. And that was the Sabbath rest principle, wasn't it? Way back there, being practiced way back in 1916. No wonder when the message finally came, I could see it so readily and easily because it had been, already been my way of life. Now, for the next two or three weeks, uh, the Lord really put me to the test because I wanted to talk, but no doors opened. So I simply said, well, that's God's business. It's not mine. And I busied myself about all the things I had to do and was in one way quite relieved not to be generating persecution against myself. And then, once I had passed my test, once, once God uh, saw that I really meant that contract, he really put me to work. And I'll just tell one or two of the remarkable experiences I had to illustrate this point. Now, for instance, uh, here's how one person arrived at my door. His name was Phil Morris and he had a farm about 30 to 40 miles from the college, a mixed, mixed sheep and cattle ranch, and uh, he had recently joined the Seventh Adventist Church and uh, was now under attack by his brother who lived in a little town called Fielding in, in the opposite direction from the college. And um, the Church of England minister was going to be there to, to challenge uh, Brother Morris and he was going to go down to his brother's home and answer for his faith. But before he went, he, he, he wished to get some reinforcements and fortifications to his mind. So he called Pastor Kranz, the college principal and church pastor, and said to him, uh, when can I come and see you on the way to Fielding? And the pastor said, well, you come at time so-and-so. Now, one thing that the, the said pastor never, ever did, so far as I can recall, is ever miss an appointment. He was a very meticulous and well-organized individual, and when he made an appointment, he kept it. But when Phil Morris arrived, the, the, the impossible had happened. The pastor had forgotten all about it and gone to town. Well, uh, the secretary at the window said to him, well, would you like to see somebody else? And he said, well, is the accountant here? And he, he'd also gone to town. Well, he said, who else? And he said, oh, I'll see Brother Wright then instead. So he came to my place knocked on the door and uh, I said come in and uh, he told me what he, what he needed and uh, what he really needed of course was, was to get something off his chest and he talked to me incessantly until he finally left and I never said a word I just sat there and listened to him but he went off feeling greatly strengthened I suppose and uh, met the Church of England minister and his brother and came away feeling rather victorious so it seems and that appeared to be the end of the matter until a few days later he came back to my door again and said I want to know about the King of the North <laughs> So he came in and that's how Bible studies began with him. If the principal had remembered his appointment, if the accountant had been in, I would never have seen this man. But the extraordinary happened and so God opened that door for me. Now a few weeks later, I was appointed to go to the same, to Fielding Church to take the Sabbath service and um, Ron Parsons, who's still more or less in the movement, although he has some ideas of his own that we don't, we don't appreciate, had recently joined the Seventh Adventist Church and um, he lived at a place called, uh, let me see, Bulls, yeah, right, a little town called Bulls, or was it Martin? I think it was Bulls, yeah. And um, on Sabbath he would bypass the Fielding Church and drive into Palmerston North Church because there was a much more adequate children's Sabbath school down there for his family of four or five children. And usually he went down there and sat with his wife in the church service and, and so on. But this particular Sabbath he drove down to Palmerston North Church, put his wife and children off and then without knowing why he did it, he drove off to Fielding, which was another 25 miles away. And um, when I arrived there at the Fielding Church, there he was. He came in and I had, I, I had the blackboard up. It was a blackboard, not a whiteboard in those days. I didn't stand on the pool. I got down on the on the space in front of the pulpit, so I had the blackboard right there. And I was close to the people and I gave them a study on the latest in church. And Ron Parsons was absolutely enthralled by this. And he said, I didn't know why. He said, I drove away from the Palmerston North Church this morning. Now I know why. He said, the, the Spirit of God brought me here. And we talked together for a little bit. And he said, can you come to my place and give me Bible studies? 
and that's how things went then over the next few months until I found myself working um, probably, well I know I, I can't, I get 15 Bible studies per week, 15 per week in my spare time, which wasn't very spare, mind you. And every one of those Bible studies was organised for me by the Spirit of God. I didn't organise one of them, not one. Well, as the year progressed, I sensed a mounting outrage on, on the part of parents, on the part of ministers and uh, college teachers against my activities, but I quietly carried on. And uh, I had a foretaste of the loud cry period because I literally saw the Spirit of God containing their rage, controlling them and, 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 and uh, preventing them from acting against me until the end of the year when I left the college for good. I resigned my position late in the year, I wrote a letter saying I couldn't, couldn't carry any further and accepted a job with Phil Morris out in his sheep and cattle ranch in the mountains. And once I'd left that place behind me, then the storm really burst. And during the loud cry, it'll be the same thing, that until our work is done, the angel, angel will contain the wrath of the wicked, but, let, but when the time comes our work is finished, they'll be unrestrained by the Spirit of God and we can't begin to imagine the rage that they'll then level against the true people of God in the last days. Now, <clears throat> I went out to, um, going out to the farm was in response to much prayer. I could have gone state school teaching and considered doing that, but in the end, I just, the Lord directed me to go and work on this farm. And I'd hardly got there when, when Bob Brinsby wrote me a letter. Now, by this time, of course, I had become known, famous if you want to use a stronger word, but known around Australia and um, New Zealand as the, uh, the main spokesman for the message of 1888 in New Zealand. And Bob Brinsby wrote to me and, uh, a short letter and said to me that I had definitely demonstrated that I was a what was what he used now uh, anyway a, a reliable a trustworthy worker he said there's, there's, there's plenty of money at the present time but there's no men to carry on the work would I stand up and be a full time preacher and instantly I said no instantly I didn't give the thing any consideration instantly I said no and I wrote straight back and said no Bob I couldn't even consider now or ever being a full time preacher and, and the, the whole idea to me was completely unacceptable now, of course, today I'm deeply grateful for that response because if I had accepted his call, it would have been a human calling, not a divine calling. And long ago, long ago I would have laid this work down because I cannot conceive of being in this position without a divine call. A human call is not good enough. And then for the next uh, nine months till September, I found myself extremely busy I would work all day for my living on the sheep and cattle ranch and those were long hours, not short hours. Evenings I'd write letters to various, to answer various questions sent to me from people all over Australia and New Zealand, well, particularly, particularly from New Zealand. Weekends I'd take the car and drive um, many, many miles to different locations around North New Zealand. Of course, North New Zealand is a pocket handkerchief country, it's a very small country. You can drive across it from side to side in, in an hour and a half at the most, and from sea to sea. North to south, you need about uh, well, from the far northern tip of the top cape down to the southern part of, of uh, the North Island would take you probably 10 or 12 hours, but that's about all. And that's mainly because the speed limit is very slow and the roads are very bendy. <laughs> so as the months went by, my work got busier and busier, and, um, and I began to worry because I was not... I was approaching the point where I couldn't cope with the volume of work being presented to me. And of course my mind began to think about different plans or solutions to this problem and I thought in terms of well maybe I should go state school teaching after all because then I have long vacations and short working hours and uh, I could then spend all the extra time in visiting the people or maybe the Lord will raise up somebody else to assist me and uh, help with this work. And on a very beautiful September morning in 1961, I was alone on the upper part of the farm. I should, I should mention the farm was on a mountain. It went straight up vertically and then it leveled off into a plateau and there were deep ravines and gullies through it. It was, it was really rugged country. And I was up on the top plateau about four miles from the homestead that is the station house or the ranch house and um, I was walking around amongst the sheep 
checking them. There was lambing time and they needed some assistance to get up. If they fell into a hole on their backs, they couldn't get up. They were too heavy and they die in that position a few short hours. So we had to walk around and make sure they were all okay. And um, as I was walking along, that same voice which spoke to me in the church many, many years before spoke again. And the voice this time said, I want you to cease working on this farm and, and go out and preach this gospel full time. And the voice was as clear as my voice is to you, except it wasn't audible. I heard the voice inside myself, inside my, my mind. And instantly I answered back. Again, I didn't feel, uh, didn't feel anything, um, any amazement or wonder or I wasn't startled or surprised. It all seemed so totally natural to me and I just, talked back very nasty and I said that's impossible and the voice said what do you mean it's impossible well I said uh, I said I just can't step out of my present position that would be irresponsible I have to have someone to take my place and uh, he had to, and, and then I, li I listed five specifications I don't know why but I did and they were he had to be a young single man because of accommodation problems he'd have to believe the message because we didn't want an unbeliever on the place he'd have to have experience in sheep farming he had to be prepared to come and last but not least, in fact this was the impossible as far as I was concerned, Phil Morris, the ranch owner, would have to accept him. Now I should mention that Phil Morris was an Englishman, uh, one of those very difficult types of Englishmen that, that always had their own way and uh, usually that was a pretty perverse kind of way as well. If he thought the wind was going to blow from the east he'd go to the west for sure. And if he thought he, you wanted something he'd take the opposite tack uh, just to be perverse. Well, when I listed those things, the, the voice came back and said, well then, tonight when you get home, write a letter to Hope Taylor, and that's Bob brings me sister, and advise her that you need someone to take your place on the farm. And that was it. I went about my work. I, I wasn't amazed or surprised or startled or anything. It just seemed so matter of fact. I went home that night and had supper and said nothing to my wife and children, and um, after supper I sat down and took the typewriter out, typewriter out, and as I sat there before I read a single letter, there appeared before my mind a very accurate picture, as time has proved, of what my future would be like. And I saw myself being misrepresented and lied about, persecuted, forsaken, betrayed, spoken against by those which should be my best helpers and closest companions. And I said to myself, that's not for me. <laughs> that's not for me. <laughs> I still think it's not for me too. <laughs> And I pushed the typewriter back and began to rise from the chair without writing that letter. And then another picture rose before my mind, the picture of Hazen Foss and William Foy. And I saw that when God called them, and they turned their backs upon God's call, that um, they lost their eternal life. And I said, hmm, that's not for me either. <laughs> so, so as the Americans say, I was between a rock and a hard place. Or as we say, I had Hobson, Hobson's choice in the matter. So to save my, myself, I rationalised, not, not a very safe uh, gambit, mind you, but I did, I rationalised it well. I said to myself, maybe the little affair up in the mountains was all a dream anyway, there's nothing to it, and if I write to have time, nothing will come of it, so I'll take the risk and write. So I wrote. I didn't say very much, I just mentioned the fact that uh, we needed a hand on, hand on the farm and that um, if it came, I, I would probably stand up and do full-time work after all. So I wrote the letter and forgot about it. I was too busy to worry anyway. And two weeks later, a reply came back and, and the reply simply stated that, that she thought there was a young man in Sydney who would fill the position quite nicely. And this now brings him into the story. His name was Victor Christensen and he was, he'd come from Western Australia and he, he had been a male nurse in the Sydney Sanitarium and Hospital of Warunga, just, just in, in the northern, a northern suburb of Sydney, the, the largest city in Australia, population of about three to five million people. And um, he had read Andreessen's letters to the churches and become thoroughly convinced about the points made by Andreessen and therefore identified himself with the awakening. Being young, inexperienced and exuberant, he was sharing these things with the, with the, male, with, with the nurses, both male and female in the hospital, and also with certain patients and naturally of course this soon got back to the powers of be. They called him in and said to him, now Victor, they said, we've heard that you believe so and so. He said, that's quite correct. And that you have been teaching this around the hospital. He said, that's quite correct. 
All right, as I said, we're not going to enter into any theological discussion right here and now. We're just going to tell you we don't believe those things. And unless you can give us an undertaking here and now to teach those things no more to anybody than you're out of this place today. Well, he said, I can't give that undertaking. They said, all right, then pack your bags. And he packed his bag, and in one hour they'd driven him out of that place. That's how, how swift they were in their actions and getting rid of that kind of heresy from their midst. Well, Victor went um, out to a friend named Alan Starkey, who was then a strong Brinsmead supporter, and still is. And he got a job working in a factory for a short time, but about that time there was a credit squeeze to bring inflation down, and lots of jobs were being lost, which included his in a very short time. Well, he searched here and there for work and couldn't find any. And one day he knelt down in desperation and said, Lord, he said, you promised that we stand for your truth. We shall not be begging bread. And here I'm almost begging bread. And uh, I claim the promise, therefore, he said, that you will take care of my needs. And as he knelt there, the mailman arrived at the gate. He heard the whistle blow because mailmen blow whistles down there when they arrive at your gate to attract your attention. Or at least they used to. I'm not sure about today. And he went out and here is the letter saying there's a job in New Zealand if you want it. What he wanted, all right, he was, he was just excited at the prospect. Now, he met all those first four specifications exactly. He was a single man who believed the message. He had experience in sheep farming back in Western Australia, and he was glad to come. And when I got the letter, I began to have some misgivings, believe me. <laughs> but, but I cheered myself up by saying, well, there's one thing is absolutely certain. Phil Morris will never accept this proposition, that's for sure. And I was very confident about that and very relieved to think that too because if I, had the, if I had found the slightest out I'd have been out I wouldn't have taken on this particular work but I said to myself well I've got to, I've got to test this anyway and tell him so I walked up to his home and he was sitting in his, in his room by himself and he's sitting room by himself and I said to him well I said Phil I said um, there's a young man in Australia his name is Victor Christensen who's prepared to come and take my place and that would relieve me from my present duties to go and preach this gospel more, more uh, widely well he sat there with a stony face I mean it was just like it was carved in granite he never said a word never flicked an eyelid never smiled never frowned did nothing but look at me and when I was finished uh, um, he, he still sat there for a moment then he said well he said and I expect him to say, forget it, just forget it, I'm not interested. Uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to accept an unknown person to work on my farm, so just, just forget it. Instead he said this, and remember of course that he was a Brinsmeadite, he never ever did get a new birth experience, that's very sure, but he was active in working with me in promoting this message and uh, we were quite good friends at that time. Well he said, as a matter of fact, I have been concerned for some time that uh, you, haven't, you don't have enough time to go and preach this message, he said, and you should be out there doing it full time. So he said, I, I prayed to God to send someone to replace you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, this answers our prayers. He said, have the boy come. <laughs> well, I was floored, honestly. I, <laughs> I absolutely could not believe my ears. And I walked out of that place I think with a very crooked track I was so stunned and what could I do now I mean I was really trapped every sign had worked out exactly as specified I couldn't start adding more so I went away to my quiet spot in the mountains where I had, had a very lovely prayer spot amongst some beautiful big um, uh, trees red, red, um, redwood trees which had been imported from America and planted out there and I knelt down and I said, well, Lord, I said, you've convinced me now that I'm to go out and preach this message full time. And I can't argue with the call and I dare not refuse it. But I said, Lord, you are the employer and therefore you are responsible for the success of this work. I will go where you send me. I'll preach what you give me to preach. But when it comes to financing the work, that's your task. When it comes to opening doors, that's your task. I shall never take up an offering. shall never ask for money. I shall never try and uh, get together a message and I shall never ever try and open a door. That's all your part. I will preach what you give me to preach or go where you send me and nothing more than that. Now, that was 1961, this 1984, which is 31 years, uh, no, 21 years, uh, 23 years rather, since that uh, contract was made. And in that time, of course, all those of you who have known me for a number of years know that an offering has never taken up at any camp meeting 
We've never made an appeal for money and yet the movement has been adequately financed during all those years and it's been an expensive uh, run of years too because travelling around the world is not something that you spend every day, it costs money. We have, a, we have a very fine print shop down there in Australia. We don't have one brass send any piece of equipment. We have an aircraft in Australia which we use and one which we have the use of here in America. Well, we didn't pay for this one, of course, in America. Alan St. Clair paid for that, except when we paid for the navigation instruments for, for instrument flying. And I don't know of a single other movement anywhere in the world that is able to operate on those principles. Not one. Take, for instance, Satan's chief agency, the Roman Catholic Church, which has prodigious wealth gained mostly by um, unfair and unkind means and so forth which we, which we shan't go into but despite the fact they have this enormous wealth they still have a very uh, efficient money making system amongst them in which people are um, virtually forced to pay and any of you who have been in the Adventist church knows, knows the, the efficient well oiled machine you use there to raise money don't you? <laughs> the offering places go around the best example I know, if I may just tell this little story, was in Palmerston North Church in New Zealand quite a number of years ago, probably about 30, 25 to 30 years ago now, and the, uh, the conference workers had come down to raise a total of £1,000, which, which today would be about $5,000. There was pound sterling back then, and pound sterling was quite a, a high value of currency. Well, they gave their usual um, talk in which they exhorted the folk to be generous and give and, and told it was their responsibility and they, they sent the offering plate around and came back at about 550 pounds. What did they do? They had it counted right away. They announced the shortage and they said, well, okay, they said, we'll take another offering in a few moments, but first of all, here's some more pep talk. And they gave them another address, another begging session, and around the offering plate went again. And it took, I think it was five, was it four or five such... Um, presentation of the offering plate before they finally made that goal and they stayed with it until they got it. And that to me, that to me was disgusting. And uh, I believe it was, yes. Yeah, I think it was a Sabbath. <laughs> and um, I'm so thankful that uh, in this movie we don't have any form of money raising uh, campaigns whatsoever. Now I did agree, the believers uh, asked me quite a number of years ago, to keep them informed during the news of you if we had any major financial commitments to let them know, let you all know. I said, oh, I provide you understand I'm not thereby suggesting you support that project just so you're informed about it. And, and, and I've stressed that point a number of times. But you very seldom even hear about that in the news of you for that matter. And I, <clears throat> I made a solemn covenant with God that in that day when the financial resources dried up, when the support ceased to flow, and I was without any question I'll accept that as God's indication to me that my work was finished I should go back and dig potatoes again and I should be very very glad to do so if that time should ever come but I have to say of course as the years have gone by the, um, the work has grown larger and stronger and we're able to meet the increasing commitments in uh, equipment and travel and so forth that uh, come in at the, as the work grows and grows and so in 1961 I stepped out and became a full time worker now I did not make an announcement to this effect I didn't then write a letter to all the folks who said right I'm now a full time worker I just began working and incredibly without us saying a single word to anyone tithes and offerings began to be sent to us we hadn't announced anything and yet it began to flow in and um, so we, we found that um, uh, it worked out that way now I remained as a full time worker in New Zealand from September 1961 until about March or was it April, about April I think the next year 1962 when we turned, we turned back to Australia but in the meantime came my church disfellowshipment. Now leading up to this disfellowshipment which is an important part of the story there had been uh, effort made by the retired uh, conference president, Pastor Forrest Hollingsworth, who'd been a missionary out on the islands during his earlier days, he'd held numerous talks with us in an effort to get us back to the church again. All were saying, look, uh, this is just a storm in a teacup, uh, there's a big fuss about nothing, and uh, we all believe the same thing anyway, so why, why be separated from your loving brethren? Come back to the fold and enjoy the warmth and fellowship and security again. I said, yes, I said, if we get this theology straightened out. I said uh, to him, but he said, we all believe the same. And I said, we don't. 
Well, he had me write out my views um, and I began to do so. And I started off by presenting the bondage in Egypt as a picture of slavery to sin, which of course is based upon the fact that Sister White says that the bondage to Egypt is an object lesson of redemption. And I gave him the first chapter to read and he read it through and he said, Fred, he said, Fred, what an imagination you've got. <laughs> what an imagination, he said. Well, that's just, a, that's just a simple historical tale. You can't draw these spiritual lessons from that, he said. And I thought to myself, how blind can you be? <laughs> so he thought I was imaginative and I thought he was blind. I wonder who was right. <laughs> I mean, if we don't find in those lessons great and beautiful spiritual truths, what's the value of them? Mere history is not going to save us. And we do have the statement in Desire of Ages 77 where Sister Wise says that the deliverance from Egypt is an object lesson of redemption. That's plain language, isn't it? And in other words, every move made, all the situations they pass through, is a type, a picture of what we pass through in our, quest, in our passage from the bondage of sin to freedom from sin. I greatly appreciate the statement in 277 in Patriarchs and Proverbs which says that um, the Passover was both commemorative and typical not only pointing back to their deliverance from Egypt but forward to the greater deliverance Christ was to achieve in freeing his people from the bondage of sin. And um, from my earliest Adventist days of course I'd always been taught that type and antitype were very closely related and we needed to understand the antitype by a careful study of the type. But he said it's all imagination and um, there was no warranty whatsoever for my taking the position I did in regard to the gospel being revealed in the land of Egypt. Well, as the months went by, of course, we got nowhere with him. He was a very lovely person, very kind, very gentle, very sincere. And uh, he did even lean toward the, the Wagner and Jones message, but he never really accepted it fully and certainly, of course, never left the church. And this meant that by the early... So the time came when he'd exhausted his resources and when he did, of course, he turned us over to the higher powers and that's when the actual disfellowshipment was finally organised. But that will be the subject of our next story as our time for this session is now gone. Any questions you'd like to ask on this presentation today so far? What was that last page on 277.